Welcome back to Sprague for Homestead. So today we're going to be talking about mealworms. So I've mentioned in a few of our videos that I started doing mealworms earlier this year. Uh, I want to say I brought them home in like February. I had bought some off of Craigslist. The lady sold me a little setup of them and we've been breeding them ever since. Now I will confess also that over the last month I was a pretty negligent worm owner and kind of forgot about them to be honest. We got kind of busy and I really wasn't feeding them like I should have been uh, but happy to say that they are still alive and doing pretty well. So you might be asking why would I be breeding mealworms? So anybody who's got chickens has probably gone in and seen the bags of dried mealworms that you can get at the store and I got thinking, how hard is it to raise these guys? And what I found out is that lots of people do it, uh, especially if you're raising something like bearded dragons or any other kind of little lizards. Um, uh, hedgehogs is another thing that they a lot of people will grow mealworms for. Um, so there's actually quite a few people doing it. There's lots of videos actually on YouTube, and I watched through some of them, and they're a little hard to understand what's going on. So let's kind of talk a little bit about the mealworms themselves. They aren't truly worms, right? They are the larval stage of the darkling beetle. All right, I don't know if you can see that. That is a darkling beetle. They are not a huge beetle. <laughs> they are typically black, uh, dark brown. When they first hatch out, they're almost white. They don't bite. Uh, they're just they're just beetles. Um, but mealworms are the larval stage of this. So they the um, darkling beetles actually go through four different stages. So obviously we start with the beetle, right? Beetle uh, goes in, lays eggs, and then when those eggs hatch, they become the mealworms. All right, and here you go. These are. Let's see if this camera will focus in here. Uh, these are the mealworms themselves. So they, um, these are actually very large mealworms. These guys are getting pretty close to being able to feed. But they're very, very tiny when they first hatch out. Um, but they sit here at this mealworm stage for, and it kind of depends, about 10 weeks on average. And what they'll do, you can kind of see that kind of gold colored stuff sitting on top of the wheat bran there. So like snakes, these guys will actually shed their skin. So they'll shed a couple of times as they go, uh, but they start very, very small. They hatch from eggs. And in about 10 weeks, they will go from this to what's called a pupa. Okay, so these funny little alien looking things, and they really do look like aliens if I could get it to close up at all. Um, these are pupa. So when the mealworms are done growing, they will shed out and go to this, and they will stay in this pupa phase for quite a while. Um, they can do it anywhere from two weeks all the way to nine months. Uh, usually nine months is this if they're going to overwinter. But what this is, is it's kind of like a butterfly going through a cocoon, right? So they, uh, the caterpillars cocoon and they gradually turn into butterflies. Well, the pupa do the same kind of thing, right? We go from larva to pupa and eventually they become beetles. And um, the reason we separate them out from the mealworms is because in this position or in this phase, these guys are pretty vulnerable. Now we'll kind of go back over here and look at some other ones. Um, they don't move much. Every now and then one will wiggle. But by and large, until they emerge as beetles, this is it. This is what they do. They don't feed. Um, they just kind of hang out. And so that makes them pretty vulnerable. So the beetles, if you've got an overpopulation problem, beetles will eat them. Uh, the mealworms themselves will eat them. So if you want to get a good beetle population, you kind of have to rescue your pupa and kind of give them somewhere safe to mature. So I go through here about eh, about every day, day and a half, and I just check for anything that has hatched or has emerged. And um, I thought I saw one in here earlier. All right, there you go. See this guy here? This is Mr. Beetle. So he has emerged just in the last day because I just went through these yesterday. Um, so I go ahead and I pull them out and I just move them straight over to the beetle colony. 
And within a couple of days, these beetles are ready to start breeding and will actually start laying eggs. So it's a pretty fast process. And um, we'll go ahead and get him over into, or her, it's, I don't know how to sex a beetle, but there you go. Um, we'll go ahead and move it over to the beetle colony. Okay, so here's our beetle colony. Same thing, you know, I keep my beetles and my pupa in shoe boxes because they don't really need a whole lot of space. And right now, I don't have a whole lot of beetles. I'm kind of rebuilding after all of my other beetles kind of aged out and died. They don't live forever. So beetles will live anywhere from 60 to 400 days, depending on conditions. So right now, I've only got about a dozen. Uh, they actually will burrow into that substrate. That's wheat germ or uh, wheat bran. Excuse me, wheat bran. And um, they'll kind of dig down in there and lay eggs. So you can kind of see that one down there on the left hand side kind of digging in. So they'll we'll kind of keep them in here for a couple weeks. That gives any females in here a chance to lay eggs. And then I move them to a different shoe box and we'll eventually move all of this substrate into a bigger container and let them hatch out. Because they'll have eggs in there for sure. So during their lifespan, the darkling beetle, uh, each female will lay between 200 and 2,000 eggs. So pretty impressive, right? And like I said, they're, they're laying within days. But we kind of do a multi-bin system. So I'll go ahead and like I said, I'll move the beetles um, in a couple of weeks into a fresh container. And then I'll end up sifting the container that they were in back into one of my bigger mealworm type colonies. I like to try and give it a few weeks. Uh, the big thing is, is mealworms and beetles both will consume the eggs. So you kind of got to get them out of there before they decide, hey, those look like tasty snacks. Um, especially if they're having any food or uh, humidity issues, they can go in there and eat them all. And then, you know, you're not going to get anything. The eggs themselves only take 7 to 45 days to hatch. And that's considered under optimal temperatures. Uh, for 70 days, you're going to have a temperature around 80 degrees. We've been keeping ours in the sunroom, and that's about what I'm seeing. My humidity is not as high out here, um, so that kind of, I'm sure, is slowing them down a little bit. I would show you the eggs, but I have yet to find them. They're so freaking little tiny, and when they first hatch, the mealworms are just so little. Uh, I tried to get them on camera, and they're just tiny, tiny. But anyway, we'll move our beetles to a new container. We'll let the other ones get a chance to hatch. And we'll move them back into the bigger colony. I've been uh, trying to harvest the bigger mealworms about every week. A certain percentage of them, and it, it's not rocket science. I just kind of pick out, you know, a dozen or so. I will leave to pupate. So I check them every couple of days, usually. And I'll go through the mealworm pin, and I will just pick out any pupa. They'll go up into the pupa pin, and then I will pull the pupa that hatch all the way into uh, beetles and move them to the beetle colony. You can do it all in one big colony. That's what I bought when I first started. Uh, Gal just sold me a 10-gallon tank full of everything, and it works, but you don't get quite the same numbers because, like I said, um, the mealworms will eat eggs. They'll eat the pupa. The beetles will eat eggs. They'll eat the immature mealworms. So for... For the best return on your investment, I suppose, uh, a separation is the best. Now, on Facebook I've, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, I've seen some really cool self-sorting trays, some of the bigger, like, bins. Uh, people have some really cool systems. This is the way I started it. I had these bins laying around for the most part, bought the tank with the mealworms. So this is the way I've been doing it, but there's definitely a lot of different ways. Like I say, mealworms prefer 80 degree temperature and 70 to 80 percent humidity. And I haven't been bothering with that. Uh, you can put moist sponges. If you use um, paper for a substrate, you can uh, mist it down every day. Uh, I find that they're doing just fine without it. I guess if we start to see a difference, uh, we can always do something different. And I may experiment a little bit this winter because they say the beetles are actually more productive uh, in a higher humidity range. So we may give that a chance. Now, as far as overall care, we buy a big brand, a bag of wheat brand just off of Amazon uh, to do for bedding. And I change my bedding out every now and then. 
And, uh, you know, you can use oats. I didn't have good luck with oats. I found that it tended to mold pretty easy, but the wheat bran really doesn't. You do feed these guys at least once a week, and what you're feeding them is carrots and potatoes, and I've heard you can do cabbage. Um, Pacific, Pacific Northwest Redworms, I think is who it is. Uh, they also raise mealworms, and they will do slices of bell pepper. Bell pepper prices are too high for me, but if you have bell peppers, you can do them. Um, you just put them in there and basically because if you tried to water them, they would drown. They get all their moisture and feed off of those moist fruits. They also will consume the substrate, so they'll eventually eat the, meat, the wheat bran as well. So as you can see, I keep them in my house. There's really no smell. If you are sensitive and have any lung issues, you might need to wear a mask when you sort through them because they do get to be pretty dusty. When I sorted through all mine here a couple of months ago, um, it did get to me a little bit because I do have a lot of allergies. So in the future, I'll probably wear a mask, but by and large, no big deal, uh, no smell. The only time you'll start to get smell out of these guys is if the fruits and vegetables and things that you're feeding them tend to mold, and then you'll get that moldy, rotten smell. Uh, I just go through and pull them out periodically. And I don't find that, at least for where I am, as dry as we are, potatoes and carrots don't really get a chance to mold. They tend to suck the moisture out of them pretty quick and that's it. So if you choose to get started in mealworms, like I said, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you can start with something as easy as a tank or a big plastic tote, something like that. What you're really looking for is something your beetles can't crawl out of. So slick sided is good. Um, you can start with as little as like a dozen. You can buy them at the feed store, usually live, like Petco, PetSmart, that kind of stuff. You can buy them online. Uh, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm sells them. I've seen a couple people on Amazon. How many you raise is totally dependent on how many you want to produce. So what I've seen is a lot of people say you want to raise about 500 beetles to feed a flock of a dozen chickens. And how often, like I said, I looked up the numbers on this and couldn't find any. Um, so how many, you know, like how often they're feeding them, I don't know. I don't know if they're feeding them every day or every other day. Uh, for what I'm doing right now, I'm getting a couple tablespoons of live mealworms every week that just go to the quail. I'm not feeding them to the chickens right now. And this is working for us, but I am going up on my beetles. I'm probably going to uh, let a lot more of my, my big mealworms turn into pupa to turn into beetles so that I can kind of rebuild a bigger beetle colony. Um, my ultimate goal is probably to have about 1,000 to 1,500 beetles, and right now I have about a dozen. So I've got some work to do. It'll take me the better part of probably the next four months to get my beetles back up to where I want them to be. All right, guys, so there's my overview on raising mealworms. Now, like I said, I've only been doing this since February or so, so I've only got, you know, six, seven months of experience. But if you have questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. They're super, super easy. Like I said, I went over a month and I didn't didn't feed or water or do anything with them, and they did just fine. So super easy to deal with. Um, I've heard of people leaving them out on a porch and forgetting about them, and they freeze and they come right back. So, uh Kind of a fun thing, and if you're looking at trying to, um, you know, maybe increase the protein count in your quail or something like that, uh, that's what we're raising them for. That's what I got them for is to raise them for my quail. They love them. I almost feel a little bit bad when I feed them because here I've raised these worms and now the quail are eating them, but uh, <laughs> it's my own little thing. Uh, but super easy to do. Lots of good videos online. Lots of good information. Uh, if you're going to look it up on Google, I would look for raising mealworms for bearded dragons. Those people seem to have way more information than anybody else. Um, so that's a good place to look is some of the bearded dragon groups that spend a lot of time raising mealworms. But like I said, if you have questions, I will do my best to answer them. You can leave them down at the bottom. You can send me an email at srhomestead at yahoo.com. Facebook, Instagram, you know the drill. I'm out and around. So um, happy homesteading, and I hope you've enjoyed this little blip into uh, mealworm raising.